Hello, good afternoon to all. Welcome, warm welcome to our events on Banking Union after Next Generation EU, held here at the Brexit Institute at Dublin City University and in the framework of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence Rebuilt, which stands for Recovery of Europe, Budget of the Union, Integration, Law and Democracy. I'm Christy Petit, Assistant Professor in EU Law, Banking and Finance at DCU and Deputy Director of the DCU Brexit Institute. And it is my honor to introduce our panel today with a few uh, words of introduction before introducing indeed our speakers. So Banking Union, as many of you will know, is 10 years old in its political inception. And today's event was actually initially thought to take place in June 2022 at a time when the Eurogroup group in inclusive format could have adopted a new work plan towards the completion of the banking union. And this under the leadership of Eurogroup president, Pascal Delonghu. This has not happened yet, um, but our event is nevertheless very timely for many reasons to not only assess the past and present of the banking union, but also to discuss its future, including in its ramifications of uh, to next generation EU, that is the adoption, but also the implementation that started of the EU recovery program after the COVID pandemics. There are many challenges and some opportunities in the current economic, geopolitical and market environment. It is my honor to introduce now our panelists. So Pedro Texera will deliver the general introductory remarks. Pedro is Director General at the ECB Banking Supervision responsible for DG SSM governance and operations, and is also a lecturer at the Institute for Law and Finance at Goethe University Frankfurt. We will hear then from Professor Jens Hinrich Binder, who is professor at the University of Tübingen. He holds a, share, a chair in private law, commercial law, company law, and securities law. Brian Hayes is CEO of the Banking and Payments Federation in Ireland, and will then give his initial remarks. This Finally, Professor um, Blaine Clark will share her initial remarks. Professor Clark holds the Macon Federal Chair of Corporate Law at Trinity College Dublin. So a warm welcome to all our panelists for today. And just a note to our audience, after the panel uh, introductory remarks, there will be space for questions, of course. So you may type them in the chat here on Zoom, or when the time comes, of course, please feel free to raise your hand and ask your question directly on screen. So without further ado, it is my pleasure uh, to leave the floor to Pedro. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chrissy Pitti, and for the very nice invitation and to be here with such uh, distinguished guests. Um, I would like to, to, to introduce this event, um, thinking a little bit, I mean, when I was proposed to, to do these uh, remarks, uh, I was thinking about the, the title. So the title is The Banking Union After the Next Generation EU. And so I was uh, thinking, okay, what is the link? Uh, what could be the link between the banking union and uh, what happened in the response to the pandemic? Um, so uh, I will try to, to, to answer that question, at least from, from my perspective. Uh, and now going a little bit back in time to, to the setting up of the banking union. You know, and uh, as you know, the banking union, uh, the concept emerged uh, politically uh, very much in June of 2012 uh, at the summit that was one of the most dramatic uh, summits of the European Council when uh, uh, particularly Italy and Spain uh, were at the peak of the, of the pressures on their debt. So there was a need for, to do something to, to address this uh, existential uh, crisis of the euro. And so the concept uh, of the banking union was to answer the sovereign debt crisis, and uh, it served as a confirmation of the deepest commitment of member states to preserve the euro. Um, so the first decision that was taken uh, at that time in June 2012 uh, was a transfer of banking supervision powers uh, from the national supervisors to the European Central Bank, uh, and they called this transfer uh, in rough terms, a single supervisory mechanism that uh, combines ECB and the national authorities. Uh, this was followed a year later by the creation and so the, the idea to create a single resolution mechanism to match the single supervisory mechanism. And the single resolution mechanism uh, is about the single resolution board and also comprises a single resolution fund. 
And so the result uh, of, the, of, the, of these uh, changes was to Europeanize the banks that were previously national. That was the intention. And so the, the entry into the banking market, the exit from the banking market, and the market functioning itself would be controlled by European authorities. And so in that sense, you know, the banking union became one of the most, uh, I would, at least I call it, one of the most perfect systems of uh, European integration. And this is because it combines the centralization of powers in European authorities. So there is no federal model. The, the, the powers are centralized in, in European authorities. European authorities apply uh, the law and it's largely European law in a consistent way throughout the, the member states. Um, also, one, one very important innovative feature is that all the decisions of these European authorities, they can be appealed only before the European Court of Justice. So the national courts are not involved uh, in, the, in adjudicating, adjudicating the, the, the banking union. And the accountability is also only to the European Parliament and the EU Council. And so there is no other, at least in my view, no other sector in the European economy that has been as Europeanized as, as the banking sector. Um, what I would like to stress, and now starting to make the link with the next generation EU, is that it's often not emphasized enough that uh, the original aim of the banking union was to actually have risk sharing between member states. Uh, and this was to, to break the doom loop that was affecting uh, several member states. And at the time, the peak uh, was being reached between the banks, between the soundness of, of banks and their sovereigns. And, uh, and Ireland knows very well what I'm talking about. And so the idea was that the European stability mechanism uh, would be uh, then enabled by member states to remove the, the liability of banks from the balance sheets of the sovereigns and the European stability mechanism would be able to recapitalize European banks, the banks directly. But in order to enable this, uh, then it was said that politically you could only have European liability if you also have European control. For example, to avoid moral hazard that the the, the member states would take advantage of European funds. And so the, the, the transfer of supervision to the ECB was a precondition for this risk sharing at level of the, of the SM. Um, then uh, ultimately, the, this involvement of the SM did not materialize. Uh, it was replaced by the single resolution mechanism that as Jens will uh, speak about it, uh, basically replaced uh, the public liability that existed for banks uh, to by pri private liability, particularly since the single resolution board can do the bail-in of liabilities of banks if the bank is not liquidated but resolved. And, um, and so the, the, this risk sharing in the form of the ESM, at least in terms of public money, it was never uh, fulfilled. So now we are reaching one decade of the banking union. So I expect that in, uh, in the course of 2024, we will have uh, several uh, events uh, marking that decade and also assessing the, the achievements of the banking union. And so there can be many perspectives from which to assess the, whether the banking union has fulfilled its, its promise, uh, at least from my perspective. And of course, I'm, uh, I'm a suspect since I work for the SSM, but, uh, but I think there is acknowledgement that the banking sector is more resilient than, than, than ever before in terms of capital and liquidity. We have uh, higher standards uh, in the crucial areas like governance. Um, we also have the ability to pursue common policies like climate change in a consistent way uh, across the, the banking sector. Um, Jens will also talk about recovery and resolution planning, but I think they are now very well developed. And we have, uh, which I think is the most uh, important achievement, a level playing field among banks and the consistent application of rules across the European Union. So I mean, we cannot speak uh, any longer about uh, protectionism taking place uh, within the single banking market. But there is still a major shortcoming. And as we know, it's not been, uh, banking union is not completed. And it's not completed mainly in the sense of market segmentation. So my, uh, the, 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 for example, the chair and the vice chair of the supervisory board often mention that we still don't see the integration that uh, we, we were aiming at seeing. So in reality, the disintegration that we had since the 2008 financial crisis, we have not yet reached that level in terms of integration. So we are still very much as we were before 2008, uh, in the sense that, I mean, the cross-border exposures of banks within the banking union are still uh, very limited. Also, as you know, we don't have much uh, banking consolidation across borders. 
the cross-border banking groups, European banking groups, still prefer to operate via subsidiaries rather than, than branches. And so as a result, we still have the banks taking national risks. So the, 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 the risks of banks are still at the national level and not as European as intended by the banking union. And so the, the paradox that is of the banking union is that even though risk sharing was one of its main objectives, now it's one of the main obstacles to the, to the completion. And uh, Christy already mentioned the, 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 the discussion on EDs that has been uh, very prominent, so I will not dwell too much on this. Basically, clearly that the debate on EDs, uh, the conclusion is that member states are still unable to share risks and to enable common resources to guarantee the deposits. And EDs would be important because it would largely remove one of the main hindrances to the cross-border flows of liquidity and capital, and also to make sure that all our deposits are treated equally across the, the banking union. Because I mean, if you have the perception that in a certain country the deposit insurance scheme is not uh, robust enough, then your deposit may be worth less uh, than, than in other countries. Um, now turning to the to the pandemic, uh, I think there we had a, a big change in the way uh, of crisis management. So it showed that risk sharing between member states can work. And the next generation EU was, uh, as you know, financed by uh, joint bonds, uh, European bonds issued by the Commission and serviced by the EU budget. And that is, is basically the ultimate form of risk sharing. And the European fiscal response was then complemented by the ECB's monetary policy response, also the supervisory measures that were taken centrally to ensure that the banks continue to fund the, the economy. Um, and the response of the, to the pandemic was therefore very different from the one we saw in the, in the sovereign debt crisis, which was largely intergovernmental. And as you know, the European stability mechanism is not a strict sense of a European organization, but an international organization. And, um, and so the, the, the assistance to the member states was provided directly by the union and, and not by other member states or by international institutions as, as the SA. And so the, I think we can conclude that the pandemic at least did not certainly lead to what we saw in the sovereign debt crisis, meaning the fragmentation, the distinction between the member states that were creditors and those that were debtors. Um, we didn't also see the doom loop between sovereigns and, and banks. So in reality, we had a reasonable, uh, despite the tragedy of the pandemic, uh, a reasonable uh, management of, of that crisis. And, uh, and I think the member states were treated in an equal way. And so the, the question is whether this response to the pandemic that enabled the, the European bonds, whether this is going to be an irreversible step of the union towards risk sharing. Because I think it showed the importance, clearly, the importance of having this common European sovereign asset, a financial asset which is low risk and highly liquid. And the advantage of this European safe asset is that it provides long term, stable and low cost funding to the economy. And also being a symbol of solidarity between member states, which is uh, also was decisive in the case of the pandemic. And in the context of the banking union, this safe asset provides a decisive instrument also to break this link, the, the original problem of the, that the banking union tried to address, to break this link between banks and sovereigns, because obviously if a bank has holdings of the, of the European safe asset, then it will have less risks connected to, to, to member states and to individual uh, countries. Now to conclude. Um, after the pandemic, uh, now Europe faces another major economic challenge due to the supply shock of the rise in energy prices and the war of Russia against Ukraine. And we have again many different features to this crisis compared to the previous one. But the underlying European problem remains the same. How to ensure risk sharing within Europe to address a common crisis, which affects all the member states at the same time, but some member states are more affected than others maybe in a, in a very different way than the sovereign debt crisis. And so as in the past, there are two options. The first option is to have a common and unified response, whereby member states share their costs and build a strong in Europe, including through a joint fiscal capacity. Or the second option, to have again uncoordinated national responses leading to higher costs and to fragmentation what has been achieved so far in European integration. European answer to the problem, uh, to the pandemic crisis, provided a blueprint about how crisis should be addressed, maybe also learning from the previous management of crisis. 
and a clear evidence that it works. In other words, European integration, and including the banking union, is not sustainable without a European stabilization capacity. And until this lesson is learned, integration will be incomplete and can, have, and can always be reversed rather, rather suddenly as it is being unfortunately again discussed. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward now to the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro, for your very thoughtful and very interesting introductory remarks. Now I will leave the floor to Jens. All right, thank you very much, Jesse, for having me. It's a great pleasure to meet a number of people again, uh, if only on screen after quite a while. It's an honor to have been invited and I very much look forward to the discussion also. Now, I've been asked to comment on the uh, state of affairs with regard to the second pillar of the banking union that uh, Pedro has already mentioned and described in some detail. I uh, was happy to, to hear that. Um, I think one important point to, to bear in mind is that essentially the second pillar, the, the pillar dealing with uh, the uh, treatment of insolvent bank or failing banks um, under the single resolution mechanism consists of essentially two uh, elements that are distinct but related. And first, the preventive or preparatory element consisting of recovery and resolution planning, and indeed on the uh, preventive or preparatory buildup of um, bailable resources by the banks covered by this framework. And secondly, then um, the actual resolution framework, which uh, kicks in once a bank actually fails. And, and I think that um, the first element, the preventive or preparatory uh, element, whatever you might call it, uh, has been a great success so far. I think this is very important to bear in mind. Um, the authorities, and in particular, the SRB has been hugely successful, even from an outsider's perspective, an academic's perspective like my own, in um, getting to know the banks, getting to know the potential impediments to swift and effective resolution and to actually deal with those uh, by addressing um, distinct issues pertaining to individual banks. So this is something I think we should look at um, as a great success. And this is certainly also uh, evidence of the need for the banking union and uh, um, a success story so far. Now, with regard to the uh, second element then on which I will focus uh, in the remainder of my uh, short uh, introduction, I think it is uh, possible to discern three uh, three aspects uh, in, in, as far as the current state of affairs is concerned. First is stagnation, uh, as I would call it, on the institutional front. Second, which, which contrasts, but certainly doesn't contradict the first point, uh, steady and uh, impressive progress with regard to the further development of technical arrangements, both at the legislative and the administrative level. And third, a growing debate on if and how this third pillar altogether should and could be expanded so as to cover also resolution or rather insolvency management more generally um, for less significant institutions, that is small banks or medium-sized banks, and indeed for significant institutions which uh, do not uh, pass the public interest assessment, uh, which is one of the great hurdles um, that was erected for good reasons, I think. Uh, before resolution actions can be initiated. Now, we, we can probably spend a full seminar on each of these uh, three points, but let me just uh, mention uh, or explain in, in, in a few moments what I mean uh, by, by any of these three points. I think the first point, stagnation on the institutional front, this is already well covered by Pedro's uh, uh, presentation. I think he mentioned both the um, role of the ESM as fiscal backstop for the single resolution fund and the um, absence of consensus on the common European deposit insurance scheme. And of course, this is stagnating, has been stagnating for years now. And um, the only uh, thing I want to add to Petro's assessment in this regard is that, in my view, the stagnation is clearly indicative of uh, a broader a conflict even between member states on um, how um, far we should go in as far as uh, the mutualization of risk sharing arrangements is concerned. And this is quite concerning because at the end of the day, uh, and I fully agree with Pedro in this regard, if we do not uh, reach consensus that uh, further steps towards mutualization and common risk sharing arrangements that uh, 
transcend the national borders um, uh, can be accomplished, then we can basically forget about a meaningful banking union that is sustainable, even in uh, the uh, scenario of systemic financial crisis like those we've seen in the, in the past two decades. Now, the second point then, um, the technical progress, um, uh, I, I, would, I would stress, um, I think we've seen a great deal of progress on technical matters uh, lately involving not just uh, an impressive degree of institution and knowledge building on the part of the SRB, also as far as cooperation and coordination of measures with other relevant actors is concerned, but also uh, with regard to the underlying uh, frame, legal framework, um, let me just point to the uh, so-called daisy chain regulation, a regulation which uh, follows up on the 2019 reform of the Capital Requirements Directive and the Capital Requirements Regulation, and further brings the regulatory framework in line with international standards. So that I think, uh, even though it's a hugely technical instrument, uh, should be seen as a milestone in terms of the uh, creation of um, a regulatory framework which should, at the end of the day, at least uh, provide a uh, sound basis for some resolution uh, measures and certainly is helpful in dealing with uh, problems pertaining to uh, the treatment of group failures. I mean, so far, uh, what we've seen was um, um, a problem to reconcile the available prudential requirements framework um, with um, specific resolution strategies. Uh, most of the people in the room will be aware of the distinction between so-called single point of entry strategies, whereby resolution efforts will be concentrated on one particular group company, usually the holding company, and multiple points of entry resolution strategies, whereby the authorities will deal with every single group member that is in financial problems um, in the event of a failure. And uh, to date, the existing um, regulatory framework insufficiently captured the uh, particular challenges posed by any of these two resolution strategies. And, and I think the uh, new regulation, which uh, has come uh, into, into uh, well, which has yes come to, to, to into force, but uh, which has been adopted this year, certainly goes some way to actually remedy those problems. I, I can't go into details, of course, but this is something that we should book as a great accomplishment. And it's and again, this is indicative of uh, a great deal of uh, uh, progress on the uh, technical level, I would say, which uh, certainly covers a great deal of uh, institutions under the auspices of the SRB and should be very helpful uh, if, uh, if things uh, turn sour in, in those institutions. So um, the third element then, and I know I'm running out of time already, um, let me just uh, mention a few things uh, with regard to the potential um, expansion of uh, this third pillar to smaller uh, institutions than those that are currently under the auspices of the SRB. Just as the commission um, uh, aimed at uh, with a public consultation launched almost two years ago, the Europe group uh, this summer has confirmed the need for what they call a broadened application of resolution tools in crisis management at European and the national level, including for smaller and medium sized banks, where the funding needed for effective use of resolution tools is available, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, this, I think, could turn out to be probably the most um, uh, significant step uh, into the future. And at the same time, probably the most controversial. Just bear in mind, and again, I can't go into details in this respect, uh, national insolvency regimes for failing institutions have evolved over decades, have been tailored to the needs of individual banking sectors. And the German example is a very good example in this regard, as it's very complex and very much tailored to the specific nature of the German banking market. And I would expect a great deal of technical problems in this regard if one uh, decided that also this part of the picture should be uh, essentially centralized, not just harmonized, but centralized in a way similar to the way we deal with um, the uh, top league of European banks, which I think in, in organizational terms is much more alike and, and, and therefore much more conducive to centralized solution than, than smaller um, institutions. So I'm rather skeptical in this regard. I'm happy to discuss this. 
and uh, I think there is a great deal of uh, uh, a great range of problems to be expected in this respect. So at the end of the day, I think uh, just to conclude, um, uh, we have reached quite an enormous uh, uh, um, success and progress so far. There's still much more to do. And I very much doubt that every single bit of the current uh, discussion of the reform agenda should be expected to be as successful as the very creation of the banking union in due course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jens. Uh, and now I will turn to Brian. The floor is yours. Thank you. So good afternoon. Hello, Christy. Hello, everyone on the panel. And uh, congratulations to TCU for bringing this all together again. I, I know we've, we've tried to get this date in the calendar, so it's great to uh, finally meet up with everyone. Um, and I would agree with both uh, Pedro and Jans. We have done a lot in this space in the last decade or so. Uh, and, and much to be done. But I, I think in any circumstance where you're looking at a kind of um, legislative and policy framework that's been established over a decade, and we tried to do this in the European Parliament in the, in the last mandate where I served, you have to do some kind of stock taking exercise to see what is working, what's not working, how we can improve that given the circumstance we face. Um, I was very struck by remarks recently made by Andrea and Ria, uh, chair of the SSM, in a recent paper he delivered in Austria, and he spoke about um, the importance of both bankers and um, supervisors, and I presume this includes academics as well, uh, having a bit more humility when it comes to the question of predictive uh, powers. And Rio's making the point that um, the SSM underestimated really the degree of liquidity and uh, leverage that was in the, banking, the EU banking system as we went into COVID thinking at the time, uh, as the SSM said, that the level of non-performing loans, the challenges that uh, would, would follow COVID was, was, was going to be more significant. Um, and, and he made the point, it's an example of how um, uh, we can get these things wrong. And equally so for, for, for bankers now, who I represent, um, we, we can't be sanguine about the, the scale of non-performing uh, loans that will follow this particular macroeconomic environment that we're in, uh, because it's quite quite unique going into COVID and during COVID and after COVID, the level of fiscal supports the government's provided was, was is uh, very different, I presume, than that which will follow uh, the next uh, year, two years, or however, however long it takes for this particular cycle to emerge. So um, I, I think that's an important starting point in this. We, we've got to be robust. Uh, in the kind of assessments we're making because of the very unique circumstances that we're living through right now, this kind of um, expect the unexpected uh, and each unexpected event brings with it a range of presumptions that I think we just can't make about what's happened in the past. Um, looking back on banking union, um, the two main drivers, I think, um, and I actually use not so much 2012 and the decision that was taken at the time to, to launch Banking Union. I actually take Lehman Brothers collapse in 2008 as the moment when we all realized that the scale of this problem was much more significant. Um, and the, the big dramatic uh, nuclear reactor of the banking industry, you know, the impact of that going off had hugely devastating effects in this country and elsewhere, uh, which I think we've got to learn a lot from. But I think the absolute priority going into the framework um, from 2012 onwards um, whether it's complete or not, I think it's, I think we all accept it's not complete yet, but a lot of progress has been made. But the two objectives were really around risk reduction and trying to prevent market fragmentation. And I think we've been very successful, actually, um, on reducing the level of risk that existed um, across the European banking environment. CRR and CRD, CRD in its sixth format now, have provided, I think, um, very significant stability mechanisms for the banking industry uh, in terms of keeping balance sheets safe and improving the kind of quality and quantum of um, uh, proper lending and, and, and having an effect as well on proper borrowing within the economy more broadly. Um, yes, it's true to say, as Pedro and Jan both said, that we have yet to see a common deposit insurance scheme. Uh, when I was in the European Parliament, uh, my, my colleagues in the EPP group would, would regularly remind me and certain colleagues from a certain country that I think all colleagues will, will, will know about, 
kept talking about you know risk reduction and risk sharing have to go hand in hand. That's a, it's a very old debate, um, but it's real for people, and, and we just can't ignore that political reality that we have got to address. So it seems to me that, and I agree, uh, you know, we should have made progress in this. I hope we can make pro progress in this, but I think um, there are other other issues at play in trying to reduce those systemic risks that that bigger countries see. Uh, in, in terms of smaller countries, and, that, and that's as much around a political environment as it is around an economic environment. We've made very significant progress, as Jan has said, on resolution. Um, the SRP has have done a very good job building up mutual funds over a, a long period of time, I think 16 years, but it's, it, I think it has helped to create a stability mechanism on resolution, making sure we move from, from bailout to bail-in. And I think probably the biggest um, success has been on the SSM um, and you know the clear mandate it's been given to be the supervisory arm for what 140 large EU banks with balance sheets of over 30 billion and that has created I think um, even for the smaller banks who aren't part of that system a kind of gold standard of expectations. It's also helped in this country and, and, and countries that went through a banking crisis to um, build up um, what I would describe as kind of peer-to-peer -peer, um, experience. So the JSTs are now in place. They come into Irish banks as they do to, to other small country banks. And it is international view as to what that bank is doing, what its business model is. Um, and that I think has been really important in building up capacity within the existing banks, but also building up a kind of um, um, legitimate supervisor expectations. Um, we've also worked hard at producing MPLs, and you know, I, I would remind the, the, the panel and the audience that in my country in 2013, 21% of all loans were non-performing, which was an extraordinary uh, hiatus, you, you could argue, uh, down now to 3%, probably still too high in the, across the ECB example. But um, I think it is important that, I mean, there, there's also very significant efficiency built into secondary markets in terms of NPL reduction, which shouldn't be underestimated as well in terms of the role played by, by retail credit servicers in moving on that debt and trying uh, trying to find solutions. Um, and I think as we go into the Basel round, um, uh, I, I agree with what the other panelists have said, uh, particularly on the daisy chain regulation, it's an example of where Europe can create um, global standards. Uh, I know our the proposal which the Commission have made, which the industry supports on the output floor, operational risk and operation um, resilience, um, I think speak to that proper global standard, which a Europe should rightly present to the world. Um, things that we've got to do better, um, obviously any institution, a young institution, such as the SSM, ECB, and all of the other ESAs that followed it, EBA, ESMA, and EOPA, um, we have to keep working at them to make sure their architecture is right. One of the problems I think it is um, pretty clear is that the international investors who look on European banks, who take the pretty dull view of European banking in the last decade, don't fully understand, I think, the interplay between supervisors and regulators, the interplay between the SSM ECB on one side and NCAs on the other. And I think it's that lack of clarity, which will take some time to resolve, which has dulled the, um, the investor appetite for European banks. And that's crucial. Uh, we now have a situation where U.S. banks are significantly bigger than EU banks. Uh, there is an issue around capital requirements for EU banks having gone through this period. There's also an issue, I think, on too much of our regulatory approach is a look-back approach. So if you take, for instance, uh, RWA's risk-weighted assets, um, it's a 20-year look-back. I, I can fully understand why, it, why, why one would do that in the context of an environment uh, which, which has particular specificity specificity when it comes to local member states. Um, but at the same time, you know, if we're going to move to a better standard of regulation, it has to be around looking forward. And that's really what we're trying to do on the, the uh, stress testing environment that the ECB has done on, on, on green assets, but, and also the kind of accountancy regime that we, we're, we're all putting in place now, IFRS R9. It's around this future looking regulation. I think too often um, it has been about the past, and not enough about the future risks and challenges that will emerge. And I think we have to keep our eye on, on that. I think the big failure um, has been the failure to really have a proper retail market. 
uh, retail credit services in Europe are really poor uh, in terms of cross-border effects. We've, we've done very little uh, when it comes to having a proper judicial approach to how we deal with debt. I note the recent report of the IMF about my own country, which spoke about very clear difficulties on recovering collateral, spoke about long-term negative effects of, of government ownership in banks, spoke about an uneven playing field from EBA guidance on things like banker pay and remuneration. So there's a range of international peer group um, views that we need to take proper cognizance of if we're going to get the banking industry to a better place and a more sustainable, profitable model, which can then induce more investment in the long term, because ultimately it's investment which determines whether or not our, our banks have their investment to put into in innovation and, and, and change. But on the retail side, I think there's a huge amount more we can do. We have seen a lot of banks retreating to home markets, my own country being one, 25% of the retail a banking market in Ireland is leaving Ireland by the end of next year. It's really unprecedented in the Eurozone country that 20, one in four of the, of the size of retail banks is, is leaving. And they're leaving for specific reasons, which we need to properly prosecute if we're honest about these issues. And I think we've also seen regulatory arbitrage and not enough clarity between home and host uh, regulators. So that, from my sense, I think they're the things that, that were re really remain outstanding, proper retail market, proper consolidation, uh, and making sure that our, our regulatory approach is as much looking to the future as it is to the past. Thank you very much, Brian. Now we will turn to Blainit, please. Um, thank you. So if you just would share the screen, um, I will just show some slides. Um, but just while I'm doing that, thank you very much for the invitation to, um, to be here and to participate in this conference. It's an absolute pleasure to do so. Um, so I was asked to, um, to look at one aspect of um, banking union, which is the supervisory aspect, and to look at it in a little bit more detail, um, and in particular to examine it in the context of the Irish banks and the Irish experiences. So I thought, um, uh, like, like Brian, I would start with a, a, a quote from Andrea and Ria. And he talked about the problems in the industry having one thing in common, that they start with somebody taking a bad decision. And I think when you focus on governance and culture, that that's the important place to start. Um, there for too long has been a, a, an emphasis on bad apples. Are, are there bad apples? Is there something we need uh, to be concerned of? Is there something we need to get them out and, and then we will be fine? Um, or is there, is there more to it than that? And I think the more to it than that leads you to what's, what's been called the, the rotten barrels. Um, and research does suggest that human responses are more dependent on situational and social pressures. And therefore, we need to understand why people make the decisions that they do. We need to incentivize them to make good decisions. And then we need to, um, to ensure that they are actually following through on those decisions, the sort of walking, um, the, uh, the talk, and the good talk. So looking back um, at instances of certainly of bad behavior, uh, we can see in Ireland that the, uh, as a result of, of three government commissioned reports uh, and a banking inquiry, that there were issues clearly in terms of governance. And some of them, um, as the Regal and Watson report said, um, are, are common in different jurisdictions, have a sort of an imprint of that global influence. But some of them are in crucial ways, homemade problems. And there we can look at issues like poor governance in the sense of a property bub bubble. We can look at the, the lending to commercial property in the way that was managed um, and poor risk management in that context. Um, and I think it's very clear in the Irish context that that was exacerbated by the fact we have a small market. And also there's a, a lack of diversity and challenge on the board. And that's something which unfortunately wasn't just confined to the, the pre-crisis. So we've seen recently the, the CBI uh, conclude an investigation of the banks um, in relation to the tracker mortgage scandal. 
And now we've seen a, a cumulative fine of 252 um, million for the banks involved. So clearly instances where, where things went wrong. So the, the response I think to the, uh, by the EU in this respect has been very uh, positive. Um, we see that there has been changes in terms of uh, fitness and probity, um, uh, uh, there has been an emphasis on reputation, on competence, on expertise, but we also see that there has been improvements in terms of culture and values. So part of the review uh, which uh, is, is required uh, by the National Competent Authority or by the, the ECB involves looking at culture and values. And we know that that is absolutely critical to ensuring uh, good behavior and to incentivizing it. Um, the CRD4 had, had issues in the sense that it, it was just a directive and therefore the idea of fitness and probity is one of the areas where we've seen uh, the least harmonization and differencing, uh, differences in practice in terms of implementation, but also in terms of criteria. So for example, part of the Irish review of, of fit and proper uh, involves an examination of ethics. So not just the person being a, an honest uh, person with integrity, but also ethics. That's not something uh, which uh, uh, applies in the other jurisdictions. Um, I think it's it's interesting to uh, to see um, that the the reexamination of the whole purpose of of um, banks uh, since the uh, since the banking crisis. And this is something we're very common with in in ordinary. Uh, institutions. So for a number of years, we've had this crisis of conscience as to what the, the purpose of a company is. And this is a large part of the debate, uh, you know, starting Milton Friedman talking about the social responsibilities of business is to increase profits. Um, and then we had a, a sort of a, a, an epiphany uh, following Davos and the business roundtable in the uh, US in, in 20, 2018 and 2019, emphasizing the importance of looking after all stakeholders. Um, so how is that uh, applied in Ireland? Um, clearly, the argument is that banks have a social license and therefore um, they have a greater responsibility um, to their customers, but also in, in a broader context in terms of financial stability. So if we look to um, the COVID crisis, I think there we can see that there was, uh, as, as Brian has described as well, there have been huge um, buy-in by the banks to actually be part of the solution rather than part of the uh, problem as in the previous crisis. And that's really, really valuable. And it's not just in terms of uh, social activism or donations, although indeed there, there were strong donations to, to research and, and to communities. But it's more than that. It's changes in the way that they actually operated their business. Um, there were instances of, of banks incurring uncompensatable costs. And if you look at the Department of uh, Finance report in that respect, um, they are absolutely clear that the sort of the, the forbearance that was extended by the, the banks and the uh, coming together of the banks and treating um, their employees in a certain way had a huge role in, in limiting um, the or certainly reducing the economic and social outcome um, of, uh, of the pandemic. And I, I think that's really pos uh, positive. Now, it's not clear. Uh, of course, there's, there's a correlation between strong governance and, and good boards um, and these sort of changes in behavior we're seeing. It's not possible to, to determine um, that the causative effect, of course, is with any research like this, but it is possible uh, to indicate that strong correlation. And I think that's valuable. And Despite that, I think it's interesting to note that a, a survey that the Irish Banking Culture Board did a public trust in the banks um, earlier in the summer um, indicated that there was still a very low level of trust in the banks. In some tech sectors, such as banking, or such as farms uh, and farming uh, sector, it was, it was really low. Um, in others, there was uh, a, a degree of progress made, so in SMEs, were, which is good to see, um, trust was improving, but still from a, um, a low level. And I think what's clear about that is that it's 
it, once trust is lost, it's hard to, uh, to rebuild. So increasing the emphasis on culture in banks, um, as is done here, I think is, is really important. Um, so I want to talk in the, the last couple of minutes remaining to me just uh, about a new piece of legislation. Um, and this is interesting because it's a, a, a piece of legislation which is designed to improve um, accountability. So it's all very well to say that, you know, boards have responsibilities or individuals and banks do, but how does that lead through to accountability? So here we're, we're following some of, um, some of the regimes which have been introduced in other jurisdictions in Hong Kong, uh, Australia, Singapore, but most notably in, in the UK with the senior managers regime. And the idea here um, is to introduce a, a more multifaceted approach to improve culture right across the border. So what you're seeing are uh, improvements in the fitness and probity regime I mentioned earlier. Um, so increasing the obligation on the, the banks themselves um, to, to certify that senior um, office holders um, are fit and proper and meet the criteria. Um, there's really important amendments to uh, enforcement rules. So heretofore, in order to hold an individual accountable uh, in Ireland for a contravention of a, a particular uh, uh, regulation for the industry, you had to prove that they participated in that contravention. And that was really hard uh, to prove. Um, that participation link is, is, uh, has been removed and that is going to, to, to make it easier and more efficient to, uh, to enforce um, uh, the uh, sanction, uh, enforce and apply sanctions for, for poor behavior. Um, there are new conduct standards um, being introduced to all regulated entities. Um, and there will be a, a responsibility for, not, for individuals for not complying with these. I think what people are talking about most of late is the individual accountability regime. Uh, this will apply to, to banks in the first phase uh, and to a, a certain number of regulated entities, um, but it will in, in due course apply to all. And again, following the UK idea, it involves um, identifying responsibilities, some which are inherent in a function, and some uh, which will be uh, assigned to uh, different individuals uh, in, an, uh, in the institution. Um, it will then require a statement of responsibility. So every senior office holder will have a, a, an indication of what responsibilities they hold, and they accept responsibility for those and uh, agree to be held accountable for that. And it's not just going to be at, at one level, we're going to see it right across um, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the firm or the institution where it will be possible to see who is responsible for each of these functions. Um, I mentioned to you that the participation link was broken. And so now um, a person has a duty of responsibility. So for functions that fall within your remit, you have to take reasonable steps to ensure that there is no contravention. Um, and that really is incentivizing behavior. So it's going to improve um, the uh, ease at which uh, individuals can be sanctioned. That's positive. Um, but more, um, more beneficial, I think, is that it's going to emphasize the importance of cultural leadership um, and uh, really uh, incentivize managers to, to, uh, to embed values and ethics uh, within their own organization. And that will make it easier both for firms, but also from the CBI to, to strengthen the process. Um, the final slide just is, is to mention that this is something um, that has been um, now taken on board uh, by the EU in the, the new banking package. And you can see there in the uh, amended SUORD, there is provision for member states to, uh, to introduce regimes like this, uh, where you have responsibility statements and responsibility maps. Uh, so my, uh, I'll conclude by saying that I think there's a lot of positive um, steps which have been taken, both in this jurisdiction and at an EU level, but clearly there are more steps um, to take. So the ECB's uh, 2021 findings from the SHREP indicated that there was still 
inadequate supervision at a, a board level, that there still needed to be greater challenges. So I think um, I would agree with, with Brian's uh, phrase and, and not referring to any uh, recent political parties, but a lot done and more to be, uh, a lot done, but more to do in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Planet. Um, so I just wish to give you the opportunity if you wish to react to each other's points, if there is anything that you heard and you want just to um, react to or have, or if you have another comment to make. Otherwise, I would go with a, a general follow-up question and invite all the participants in the audience to write a potential questions you may have or even to raise your hand and then you will, we will ask you to come on screen to ask the question. So um, as a general follow-up question for all of you, uh, if you could maybe, if we project ourselves to the future and try to imagine the, the banking union state in 10 years, I know that some of you already pinpointed at some of the challenges to, to take on, but what would be the key drivers uh, to continue and to achieve and, and go within a, a reality that is helping to consolidate the banking sector, to ensure that there are pan-European pan banks, some, some of these challenges that are still on the table. And maybe there I would go uh, in reverse order. And of course, uh, please let me say that uh, I, I flagged a few issues, but you're not obliged to concentrate on that. Uh, as our event today is focusing also after Next Generation EU, I'm happy if you want to take on uh, the digital and the green transition, for instance, that are also uh, very big challenges we have on the table uh, at the moment. Uh, so, uh, Blaine, if you wish to start. Uh, thank you. Um, so sticking with the same uh, theme, I, I think one of the, the big challenges um, will be to ensure that the boards of the banks are um, competent uh, and uh, willing and able to deal with some of the challenges which have been met. Um, so there have been questions as to uh, the need to increase diversity, both uh, gender diversity, but also um, uh, cognitive diversity to have that sort of independent challenge uh, that seems to be missing. Um, and so I, I'm hopeful that the changes, the sort of holistic res uh, response um, that's been taken will improve that. But I think we, we can't underestimate the, the, the difficulty involved. So just thinking about the, the digitalization and also climate change, to have the, the expertise around the board to make decisions on issues like that is, is really going to be a tall order. So by, by way of example, a conversation I was having last week about uh, ethical AI and how decision makers will uh, know uh, the, uh, in the first place whether AI is being used, but also whether it's ethical in terms of the input of the data, the use of the data, um, and you know those, those sort of uh, judgment calls uh, which are going to be difficult similarly, in terms of sustainability, we've seen the difficulty. We, we do have additional re requirements now in terms of uh, disclosure and risk management, but to be able to make that assessment, um, I, I think is, is, is going to be a, a, a feasible, but, but demanding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Yes. Yeah, I certainly think um, looking ahead for the next 10 years, I mean, the biggest challenge is going to be the, the transition and the climate transition. Uh, take a country like Ireland, 20 billion a year will be needed in investment over the next 10 years uh, to help businesses, corporates, big and small households, individuals with the transition. The IMF has have assessed that um, no more than about 25% of that will be directly government subsidized and EU supported. So three quarters of it, at least, will be from private market placement and private credit. So I mean, the fundamental task of a bank is as a credit intermediary. It, it, you know, it provides payment systems, it allows a safe place for your money to be deposited, but it also fundamentally is absolutely the heart of credit formation. So banks have got to be able, I think, to have much greater uh, public-private partnerships in order to get that climate balance right particularly on things like data. We've got to move away from proxy data and towards proper use of, of data that is there, A, to assess existing uh, balance sheet requirements, but B, then uh, to look at um, how we're going to make sure that the new products that the banks have 
actually fits the taxonomy set uh, that the EU have set. Are, we are going to see fewer banks though in the next 10 years. So it's going to be fewer banks in Europe, fewer branches, uh, fewer people working in banks, but different people working in banks as well. So you're, the, the banks will have to be able to have data engineers, AI, uh, to, 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 to Vaughan's point, um, a range of skills in the sustainability area that's, that they need to especially uh, enhance. Um, and ultimately, if banking union means anything, it means proper cross-border banks that actually offer cross-border services to consumers. And um, that's, I think, where rubber really hits road. If you look at, say, the success of Usits as an investment tool, it's, it's a genuine uh, EU-wide uh, branded uh, product. We don't have the same appetite when it comes to retail credit services. And I think if, if we are really going to get to that better place with proper banking union banks, it has to be cross-border. But there's huge challenges for policymakers to make that happen. And it's mostly around a, a proper approach to consumer protection, which is on an EU-wide basis, rather than local specific, specific requirements, a proper approach uh, to, to capital, capital waivers. Mr. Enria constantly asks the banks to produce proper capital waivers that they can utilize their economies of scale. And uh, it, it really means proper product diversity, ultimately. So I think that that's where the challenge is. And we're probably going to move to a, a kind of a premier league of banking, which have much bigger banks, um, but actually banks ultimately that, that can try to resolve uh, the choice and the innovation that people need to see and want to see uh, across the banking sector. Thank you very much. Uh, Jens? Yes, thank you. Um, just to pick up on the uh, climate change issue, I've just completed a study on the use of provincial requirements uh, as an instrument to induce banks to become greener and more sustainable in their lending and investment activities. And I must say, I'm rather skeptical uh, in that regard. I really don't see how um, um, in the absence of uh, more detailed and more reliable knowledge um, about the interplay of uh, climate risks uh, on the one hand, the trade-off uh, between climate risks on the one hand and banks' profitability, we can really hope to, to make much progress here. I think that there's a lot of political uh, fuel in the debate right now, but I'm rather skeptical when I look at the technicalities. Uh, second, um, as far as the uh, the prospects for the current reform agenda is concerned, I'm, 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 I think we, sh we, we should be realistic. I don't see um, the rollout of the whole regime uh, to smaller and medium-sized institutions that are currently outside the scope of the banking union. And that is, I think, for good reasons, because uh, very often we find what we find when we look at the groundwork is that the arrangements that have been in place for quite some time do work and uh, it would uh, come with some cost to existing frameworks if we wanted to change that within and replace it with an untested regime. So I'm skeptical in that regard. Uh, I'm also skeptical when it comes to the very top of the league, that is to institutions and groups like Deutsche Bank in Germany, giant banking institutions with a global outreach. I, I, I really do doubt that uh, any resolution regime, however refined, can be relied upon to, um, to uh, deal with problems in, in this kind of institution, uh, which uh, God may prevent for, for all future times. So I, I'm, I'm, but I think what we will see is a great deal of consolidation um, as far as the medium range is concerned. And this is clearly the majority of European banks so far. I think that, that there has been a great deal of improvements and there will be further improvements down the line. So I'm expecting the SRB and the SRM to be successful, to continue to be successful in this, in this area in particular. Which brings me to the last point, which goes back to Pedro's uh, presentation. I'm, I'm not quite sure about the prospects and the potential of the banking union for um, uh, as, as a driver for, for a greater market integration. I think for a wide range of reasons, um, European consumers of financial products in all different types of, of uh, um, areas of subsectors are rather um, well, um, local in their in their 
uh, preferences and probably will continue to, to, to remain so. Even if we manage to create EDs, there will be reasons to stay local and buy local in financial terms rather than um, uh, go um, abroad. And I think uh, this also has to do with one major problem. And this is my last sentence uh, that we, we will continue to see in the European law framework. I mean, what we've seen is consolidation, harmonization in regulatory terms, correct? But we haven't seen uh, any um, harmonization of um, uh, pri the private law of financial products uh, outside the narrow area of consumer protection. And that's for the simple reason that there is no mandate for the European Union to go into this area. So the European Union does not have a mandate uh, to um, uh, implement um, a full harmonization of applicable contract laws, for example. Um, and I think this is a major obstacle that we're likely to see also in 10 years' uh, time. And that uh, will remain uh, one of the reasons why people will prefer to stay local. And therefore, I'm rather skeptical about the prospects for further market integration. Thank you very much, Jens. Uh, Pedro? Thank you. Um, no, no, I, I agree with uh, most of what has been said, and indeed uh, what Jens was just saying about the fact that uh, local regulations, particularly in terms, of, in terms of consumer protection, will still be, be there in 10 years. I think really this will be a constraint to, to further integration. Uh, I think it's, it's very difficult nowadays to, to predict anything. Uh, what I'm curious about is the impact of uh, digitalization. I mean, clearly we see uh, emerging and we ourselves are users of that, uh, of the new banks, new institutions that offer uh, uh, digital uh, products uh, in terms of uh, you know, investing your savings. I mean, there, there are now many new platforms. So I'm, I'm quite curious about how indeed they will be able to penetrate into the different markets. Uh, my, my feeling is that they, they might be successful indeed in uh, having cross-border business. I think they, they, they target these sort of platforms. They target a lot of uh, cross-border business. And the banks, uh, the traditional banks, if you wish, they are compelled to compete. So what I'm curious is um, indeed what will be the, the impact of this digitalization, because it's clearly a cost driver uh, that will cut costs for, for banks' business and will also imply new challenges on how to regulate and supervision. So my guess, and particularly in the times that we are now in, um, that I mean, the issue of security and integrity will be quite important in the future. So we should not also not forget that we have now the, the plan to work towards having a new PNA and our authority. And so I think the combination of this digital business, the complexity of IT risk and cyber risk, the, the, the challenges that will come uh, and the concerns that uh, people will have more and more due to the geopolitical environment for, for security, this combination will lead to a new environment. And uh, so this clearly is a challenge for, for us uh, supervisors, uh, but it's also a challenge for banks about how they're going to use, for example, big data, how people will accept that the data is used. And, um, and of course, I fully agree that also the, the, from that perspective, also the governance of banks will be key, that uh, when we are dealing with digital platforms where we don't see the, the, the managers behind and who is behind, clearly the fact that the, 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 at least the management board should be trusted in, also in terms of diversity of concerns of knowledge of different types of knowledge, that will be particularly key. So. Uh, Right now, it's difficult to predict, but uh, but indeed, it's, it's it's a concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we will open the Q&A session. I see that there is already one hand raised. Um, yes, Noreen, if you can activate your camera too. And unmute yourself. Yes, please go ahead. Said and done, Christy. <laughs> uh, thanks, Christy, for organizing this afternoon. Um, I have a question for uh, Jens, if I may, please. Um, Jens, I, I think I interpreted you um, correctly, but please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, I thought that you, you may have been saying that for the larger um, institutions that are managed, supervised directly, um, by the ECB, that you can see how single resolution would work for those, but you would envisage difficulties for 
um, more regional domestic banks. Um, and I'd just like to understand that a, a, a little bit more, you know, what, what specific issues would you see emerging? Um, intuitively, my own interpretation would be that insolvency is insolvency and regardless of size. Um, so I'd just be interested in, in, in what specific issues you, you might see emerging. Right, thank you. I think there are a number of, of, of issues here. First, I think it makes good sense to uh, reserve the um, res single resolution framework, as has been done in particular by what we call the public interest assessment to large institutions, because uh, we have a rather homogeneous groups, group of, of, of banks in that bracket, right? We talk about usually listed institutions, which uh, um, are more or less all organized as um, 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 corporations. Um, we are not talking about, usually about large cooperatives here. We're not talking about public sector institutions, but when we look at the, at the uh, lower level, we have all those different institutions in place. Take, take my own country as an example. We have three major, what they call groups of banks. We have the private banks, which comprise both very large institutions like Deutsche Bank AG, but also small um, specialized banks, uh, but most of them are organized as corporations. We then have a second group, which is very large, consists of uh, several hundreds of cooperatives, which have a totally different governance structure and also work differently uh, under, under in insolvency situations. And we finally have a group of, of institutions which uh, are complete, organized in completely different ways, namely as public sector institutions, public sector um, entities which uh, have their own governance structure and cannot easily become insolvent technically. And, and co both cooperatives and savings banks have set up their own institutional protection schemes which effectively um, do not bail out failing institutions, but basically restructure failing institutions within those networks um, without outside help. Now, this works reasonably well, but it also creates its own idiosyncratic problems. And if you want to establish a common single centralized uh, resolution slash insolvency management framework, you would have to find, find ways not just to deal with the technicalities that are characteristic of any of these uh, institutions, but also um, you would have to find ways to um, substitute uh, existing arrangements that actually have worked pretty pretty well in the past, right? And this is my concern. I, I don't really think looking at the huge discrepancies between the banking systems of every participating member state that you could find a way that would uh, capture all the um, individual characteristics um, effectively without doing away with um, the positive aspects that we, we see. And I don't think that member states will ever subscribe to that. So I don't, don't see political consensus, for example, in my country to give away um, our own control over the individual banking parts. And this is why I'm skeptical, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I received a question which is uh, going back to the energy crisis and the consequences of the of the war in Ukraine. And how can the banking sector uh, could contribute to economic resilience, but also build up on uh, more sustainability? So I guess that uh, as it's more for the banking sector, maybe Brian, you would like to elaborate on this one? I mean, I think the three pr priorities that we've got to work towards um, so, and some of the legislation is already in place is, as I said, around data. We, we don't have enough public and private data collections. Uh, taking my country at the moment, the two obvious parts of data, uh, one, the BER ratings, and two, um, what we call uh, flood mapping across the country. Um, we have difficulty as an industry in obtaining that data because of the data protection uh, issues, which actually the European Commission is, wants to do something about in terms of moving away from proxy data towards um, more public available data, something that the Central Bank of Ireland actually agree with in terms of having access. How can banks possibly assess the quality and standard of their own balance sheets unless they have access to that data? Um, as I said, the other critical issue I think will be around um, moving the skill chain up within the banking system on sustainability 
uh, and producing longer bonds. And I have to say there, there's something which I think we should not underestimate in this country as well, and, and in other internationalized banking environment. Uh, a third of all the people who work in banking in Ireland are, do not work in retail banking, they work in international banking. These are wholesale uh, third country, in some cases, banks, US, Canadian, British banks that operate here, as is the case in Germany, uh, operate two branches or LSI's arrangements here. They provide a crucial uh, form of provisioning for next generation EU. Uh, the EU bonds, green bonds that have been established, which are so cru crucial for the next 10, 15 years um, in, in terms of the transition. Much of the financial engineering happens actually by US banks. And what's, I think what's, what's going to be really important as we go forward is to keep that liquidity, the expertise, and the capital prowess in, in the European Union. Um, I'm somewhat concerned about some of the um, comments that have been made about um, strategic autonomy. I prefer to call it open strategic autonomy, where we, we don't want a kind of protectionism in Europe which prevents uh, third country banks from helping us to do the things we need to do as European citizens. So that diversity of banking structures um, is, is really important. And I think that could be a big driver, particularly when it comes to the green agenda across the European Union. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, any other inputs or insights on this aspect? Uh, maybe Pedro from ZSS. Oh, ah, yes, Blaine, uh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. You know, I, I was just going to, to add to that and just uh, talking about uh, the issue of greenwashing, obviously, is, is something that we're, we're going to have to, to, to tackle. Um, but I, I think in terms of regulation, you obviously have to be aware of the, the perverse incentives and, and the perverse consequences um, which arise. And I, I think what we're seeing now in some of the disclosure regulations is the idea of green bleaching. Um, and I, I think that is is just it just it, it shows you, I suppose, that the, the complexity of the problems that we're going to have to in, to engage with and that have been raised. And uh, as I say, the, the 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 fact there is no simple solution. And you know, talking about green bonds, but the issue of what is green and who is going to decide, um, and whether it, it becomes just too difficult to fall within that. And again, who are the guardians of it? So these are sort of issues that I think are sort of aired in the media. So yes, there are problems for regulators and supervisors, but also there are real problems in terms of um, ensuring that trust remains um, uh, in these uh, in these sort of bonds, so that they are viewed as something that that really is uh, you know is is going to be sustainable in the future. Maybe could I, if I can just make that remark, what Blonis said is absolutely right. Of course, we have um, a lot of evidence from the, the funds and asset industry who went first in the whole disclosure regime, as they had to be because of the, the, the nature of having proper disclosure on investments. So we, we, we can learn from that as an industry. But I also think we need to learn the lessons we've just gone through, as you know, the stress testing uh, uh, for um, uh, bank balance sheets across Europe in terms of, of how green is actually that those bank balance sheets. And there's some advantages in Ireland that we have. We don't have had heavy industry in a way that other EU countries uh, have. We have our own issues around ag agri lending, which uh, it has to be addressed in, in terms of methane and the like. But there, there are is issues, I think, that can help us as a banking industry to learn from what happened in the first disclosure regime. And secondly, um, we need to be able to find um, in all of the products that are that the banks have to bring forward, uh, absolute alignment on the taxonomy, uh, which has gone through, um, which has gone through the European decision-making process. Um, otherwise, uh, there will be an, potentially an, another phase of mistrust from the industry, and I think it is really important. Uh, this is actually an opportunity for the banking industry on making the transition work for individuals uh, and for businesses. To be able to show um, that we've learned the lessons of the past. And the other remark I'd make is this in a sense, I'm not worried so much about the corporates. I think the larger corporates have, I mean, a very, very integrated system. I'm very concerned about the smaller businesses, the SMEs, where their, their, their path towards transition is not as clear, I think, or the level of ambition 
that we need to see across business is not as clear. And that's a, that's a common problem across the European Union, not just in Ireland. Thank you, Brian. Um, Pedro, you wanted to intervene. Thank you. Um, no, I can add that, I mean, as it is known, I mean, the CBE, uh, I mean, climate change is uh, basically a problem of coordination failure. And so what uh, the ECB tries is indeed to set the expectations about how banks should tackle climate change, seen as a clear risk for their balance sheets. I mean, banks are exposed to climate change uh, risks, to environmental risks, uh, and even to I mean, risks in biodiversity. And so what we try is to set our expectations and try to adapt. The, and I agree with Brian that the, the road is not yet uh, clear but this is not an excuse not to not to start and so we are adapting the bank's expectations and practices uh, so that i mean indeed this road starts now to to be uh, to be taken and that that's uh, what we are doing right now thank you thank you thank you very much i actually received a question which is probably linked with our audience um about um the fact if, if Brexit is still a challenge for the banking sector, and I guess here the question would be for the euro area banking sector, but maybe also the Irish banking sector, um, who would like to take this up in terms of the last years, I guess, and maybe still nowadays? Um, I, mean, I, I think the, the desk mapping exercise that the ECB has put in place is, is, is really quite comprehensive. Um, and Mr. Henry was in, in Dublin only a month and a half ago, he spoke to all of the banks here, and he spoke about a, a lot of the kind of um, coordination between the SSM ECB on one side uh, and the UK bank authorities in trying to work through some of those problems. Um, as you know, the um, existing regime on, on clearing, Euro-denominated clearing remains until, Pedro, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the end of 2024. Um, and and, and I, I'm aware of you know, the long-standing ECB priority, correctly so, to move Euro-denominated clearing to the Eurozone. But at the moment, of course, um, clients and infrastructure um, are still looking to the UK. But I, I do think that one other remark I'd make about the, I mean, I think that a lot of the work that, that institutions put in place in preparing for Brexit, um, th that, that work has been, you know, quite comprehensive. And I, I think it's, it stood the test of the last number of years. Whether or not there will be another wave of businesses who now choose the, the Eurozone to locate their businesses in as a consequence of political instability and, and, and ultimately regulatory instability is another matter. Um, but I, I think the institutions have really stress tested their position well and have worked hard with regulators and supervisors to, uh, to de-risk some of the potential risks that were there from Brexit at the outset. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Anyone else willing to? Yes, Pedro? I can, of course, confirm what uh, Brian said. I mean, uh, the ECB did this uh, test mapping uh, review, which is basically to check the credit and risk management uh, practices of the Brexit banks in the banking union, in the sense that, I mean, we deal in terms of financial stability and also management of risks. And our duty is to ensure that indeed that banks do not have empty shell structures in the, in the banking union. And so the, the result of this review was to check whether banks indeed were complying with that requirement again for the sake of financial stability since UK is now a third country uh, towards the, the banking union. Uh, so as any other supervisor would do and for those banks that we find that are not complying materially with all our, our guidance then we would take uh, I mean, the measures needed and the instructions needed to, to re-establish that. But I mean, I think this is ongoing and uh, right now we don't uh, perceive any major problem going ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. If um, I may maybe ask a question because we had a, a little uh, debate just before having this event on the recent paper that was published, so a policy insight, if I'm not mistaken, from the CEPR. And um, well, there are different uh, proposals for reforms. And I think, uh, Jens, if you're willing to engage with some of the points that were made there. Yes, thank you. I mean, this is a paper uh, entitled Completing the Banking Union in Economic Requirements and Legal conditions, which is kind of a stock-taking exercise, uh, rather comprehensive. So 
um, because it covers both the uh, single supervisory mechanism and the single resolution mechanism. It argues that essentially um, the uh, banking union so far has been a failure and that it did not succeed in removing uh, the potential for um, um, national interest to trump European ideas, as, it's, as it says, and uh, because the uh, bank sovereign nexus, that is the exposure of, of banks in the Eurozone to uh, debt issued by the re relevant um, jurisdiction has not been removed. And that resolution hasn't worked effectively because there have been a number of cases where the uh, instrumentarium has not been applied in particular in relation to Italian institutions. Now, um, I, when I read the paper, I found it remarkably negative. Um, I think um, I wouldn't subscribe to this kind of uh, purely negative uh, assessment of what has and has not been accomplished. Of course, there are many areas where we need to go further. There are other areas where ideally one should go further, but probably can't because of uh, many political and legal obstacles and so forth. But um, uh, the paper then moves on to present a number of policy proposals, including, for example, and this is um, from my perspective, probably the most interesting one, in, including by fully centralizing and integrating uh, bank crisis management across the board without any national exceptions, without any um, uh, leeway for participating member states to deal with failing banks. This very much goes back to Noreen's question a few minutes ago. Um, I'm, I must say, for the reasons mentioned, um, I'm, I'm incredibly skeptical that this can work. And I'm also skeptical that member states will ever give away their powers in this regard. Um, I'm also uh, skeptical that this is what we should uh, be wishing, really, um, because at the end of the day, one has to realize that those um, minor institutions, which currently fall not do not fall within the in the scope of the banking union uh, proper and the single resolution mechanism, um, can be dealt with without great harm uh, in ways that uh, are very close to traditional forms of insolvency management, and usually those forms of insolvency management. Um, have, can be quite capable, as we see in the case of Germany, where, where this has worked reasonably well and in other jurisdictions as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical that in order to remedy the deficiencies or the perceived deficiencies of what we see right now, we should go for uh, even um, more ambitious centralization. I don't really buy into this argument and I don't see that it's, it's realistic. So I think we should stay realistic. And um, this is something um, which of course um, is currently being debated and will probably be debated very controversially. I see Nicolas Veron, one of the authors. Uh, uh, yes, uh, indeed. For the floor and I'm, I'm of course looking forward to his comments on this. Sure. Thank, thanks a lot, Jens. Uh, yes, Nicola, please go ahead. And welcome. Nice to see you here. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for um, uh, publicizing our recently published paper, which, as you put it, the chat was just published by uh, CPR and is also forthcoming in a very similar version at uh, Bruegel. Um, so the paper, <laughs> Jens Hinrich said that the paper is negative in tone. Uh, in a way, that's because of what the paper is about. The paper is about the unfinished business of banking union. So it doesn't spend a lot of time, uh, you know, uh, saying a lot of good things about what has been achieved, uh, not because we don't think there are great things about what has been achieved, but just because that's not what we wanted to focus on in this paper. So uh, so, so I think the, what you call the negative tone is just a recognition, which I uh, would argue is based on fact that the agenda of banking union is still unfinished. Um, the the point about small banks and you know things that work well in Germany is that you mentioned. I, from my perspective, this is really a German issue. It's not a member state issue. It's a German issue because the German system is so specific. And indeed, uh, with the possible exception of Austria, there are no other member states where so-called uh, institutional protection schemes play the role uh, that they play in Germany, uh, certainly in the eurozone. So, so I think it has to be honestly recognized as Germany being an outlier among member states in terms of uh, the way banking sector uh, is organized 
uh, the importance of the institutional protection schemes, also, frankly, the importance of public sector banks, which has no equivalent in other member states. And therefore, I have a question to you, Jens Hinrich, and sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, you said the pattern of, um, you said it's not a bailout, I don't know why, uh, but of uh, rescuing failing or ailing banks uh, among those institutional protection schemes has worked quite well. But we've seen enormous amounts of public money being uh, spent on the landers banks. And the landers banks, as far as I know, are part of the same institutional protection scheme as the Sparkassen. As for the Sparkassen, of course, rescuing the landers bank is a way to rescue the Sparkassen because they have a lot of exposure to landers banks. And uh, in terms of the rescues of ailing Sparkassons themselves, there is so little transparency that it's impossible to know how much it costs and how it's done. So, um, so basically, my question is, what makes you say that this system works reasonably well? And can you point us to any piece of literature that would uh, basically support that uh, proposition? Thank you. OK. Um... Uh, this is a short question, which brings me to rather complex issues. Um, um, I think I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't want to be uh, interpreted as a defender of the German public sector uh, uh, banking system, uh, which consists, as you rightly say, both of large institutions called the Landesbanks and the smaller ones, the, the savings banks proper. Um, um, what I see is that in the savings bank sector, just as in the cooperative sector, um, failures have not yet spilled into uh, the broader financial system and have not created externalities beyond the borders of, of that particular subsector. And that is something that one has to take into account. Um, what I was referring to when I when I um, talked about uh, the success was also, uh, and this is, I think, an important example, the uh, uh, specific two-tier deposit protection structure that has been established by the private banking institutions, that is by corporations, uh, since the Herstatt failure in 1974, where we see um, um, a great deal of uh, individual failures having been dealt with, um, with remarkably little fallout uh, for, for the depositors involved. Um, and even if you don't buy into the argument that these arrangements um, um, are to be considered a success, and I, 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 I'm fully ready to, to, you know, to, to settle uh, in this regard and to give way to criticism, um, but um, uh, I, even if you even if you see this um, as, uh, as something to be criticized, I think it still still needs to be seen as a fact of life that we do have these individual subsectors. They're not likely to go away, and uh, for that very reason, any new system that would supersede or replace uh, the existing one would have to uh, deal with that fact of life. And what I'm arguing is that you will not be able to find. Um, a system that uh, works for all because of the, in the idiosyncratic features and that um, indeed this is not really necessary because um, it would create a huge new administrative framework which is costly in itself without really um, a need to do so in terms of uh, you know uh, greater cost benefit or, um, effect and um, uh, a greater well, turnout in, in terms of greater creditor protection. I, I, I don't see how this uh, would place. And of course, you're right, this is a German position, but of course, uh, Germany is one of the member states that would be affected. And of course, solutions would have to be found also to deal with a specific scenario here in Germany, which I, I of course, did not create and would, not, would never recommend uh, as a blueprint for the creation of a national banking system. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jens. Um, I see that, Nicola, you still have your hand raised. Oh. Yeah, just as a, as a question of clarification, uh, you said there were no spillovers outside of the systems, which I understood to be the institutional protection schemes. But unless I'm mistaken, there have been tens uh, of uh, billions of euros spent to rescue the lenders' banks from taxpayers' money, including the budgets of the lender, uh, 
but from outside of the institutional protection scheme. So can you clarify this point to explain of it Of course, better? I was referring to the to the treatment of failing savings banks, as I said, not about, not, uh, I wasn't talking about the London banks. And, and uh, you're fully right about the London banks. I mean, I'm not talking about London banks. I'm one of the fierce critics of uh, the existence of these institutions, and I'm not supporting the notion that they uh, should be treated as, as role models. That's my claim. They're part of the same institutional protection scheme, correct? That is correct, but I was talking about uh, the treatment of failures in the savings bank sectors only, and I, okay. I said, said so. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And uh, I'm afraid that we're reaching the end of the event already. Oh, Pedro, sorry, you wanted to, to say a few words. <laughs> uh, to, to, to add, I didn't uh, mention the, the paper in the beginning, but clearly, I mean, I recommend the reading in the sense that it shows the challenges if we want to have a banking union that is really a banking market as if it were a single jurisdiction. And I, um, I raise your attention, for example, to one of the proposals, which is to have a centralized bank taxation. And clearly, if we want to have banks that are fully Europeanized and banks that uh, go about their business across uh, all the bank, all the countries of the banking union, uh, clearly that uh, then it makes sense to have, for example, European taxation in the future. So I think the, the paper indeed unveils all these uh, tricky and difficult issues that ultimately are needed to have a, a single banking market as intended by the banking union. But I, I agree that uh, it's not going to be easy, but still, the fact that these are very clearly and very structured in a very nice way, I think is quite useful for, for debate. So thank you, Nicola and all your colleagues. Yes, sure. I mean, this is showing that with the last question, we, we're opening up another debate, I think, where we could also spend one hour and a half easily uh, and going into many technical details and aspects, too, as to the specificities of, of some banking sectors, too, right? Um, and some case law, too, because actually we didn't even touch upon uh, the judicial review, which is enormous in the field, actually. So I think there are many, many other issues to, to discuss. I want to warmly thank our panelists. So uh, thank you, Pedro, Blanet, also Brian and Jens for your time, for, for your insights and also engaging on these questions. Um, I want to thank the audience too. Um, the event has been recorded, so it will be available later on our YouTube channel and an event report will be written by Pierre Mario Lupino, who is connected there. Hi, Mar Pierre Mario, and thanks a lot for uh, writing it up. It will be published tomorrow. And then just a very short reminder about our next event on December 1st. So this will be focusing on Brexit from a global perspective, how the UK withdrawal from the EU affected Ireland, Northern Ireland, Europe, and Trans Atlantic relations. It will be available as a, an, a hybrid event because it's held in uh, Princeton University uh, with uh, Professor Federico Fabrini. So uh, if you're not already following us, please follow our activities. We have plenty of uh, activities upcoming, including an annual conference in January in Dublin on Next Generation EU. So this will be uh, connected to this event and many other issues. Um, thanks again to our panelists, and I wish you a very pleasant evening. Bye.